Knowing if a species has in fact gone extinct can be difficult to assess. What if the population is just really small? What if the area the organism is known to live in is hard to access? What if we don't quite know where to find them to begin with? Birds are highly mobile, capable of hiding away in the forest canopy or hidden mountain ravines. So when we stop seeing a species of bird, finding it again can prove to be incredibly difficult. In this video, we're looking at five species of bird that may be extinct or may still be alive. Perhaps one of the most well-known possibly extinct species of bird in the world is the ivory-billed woodpecker. But many don't realize that in Mexico, there is a very similar species that is assumed by some to be extinct, but may still be out there. In the pine forests of mountainous western Mexico may still live the largest species of woodpecker in the world, with a body length of as much as 60 centimeters. The imperial woodpecker's feathers are a stark black and white, and on the tops of their heads is an amazing curled crest, black on the females and red on the males. They feed on beaval larvae, and the species was known to need a very large tract of untouched forest in order to find enough food. A single pair likely needed about 26 square kilometers, and when they gathered in groups of seven or eight birds outside of the breeding season, they may have needed as much as 98 square kilometers to survive. The woodpecker's population has likely always been small, probably not numbering over 8,000 birds at any given time historically. But as the population of Mexico grew and their habitat became more and more fragmented, the species lost much of the large untouched forests that they needed to survive. On top of this, they were hunted for their feathers, for food, and for medicinal purposes. Despite this, their population remained relatively stable into the 1950s when it suddenly crashed. The last confirmed sighting of an imperial woodpecker was in 1956, and since then, the species has been feared extinct. In 2010, Cornell Lab released the only known footage we have of the species. It's easy to identify the woodpecker thanks to its amazing crest, huge size, and brilliant black and white coloration. Unconfirmed sightings have continued. Some anecdotal evidence suggests that the birds persisted at least into the 1990s, with people living in the small towns of the mountains claiming to have seen them through the decades. A search team in the 90s compiled a list of eight credible sightings since the last confirmed sighting in 1956. But sadly, since the 90s, very few sightings have been reported. If the species is still alive, it would be in an area where very few outsiders go. It's believed to possibly still be extant, in particular because of how few people actually know about it or ever go looking for it. Do you think the imperial woodpecker might still be out there? In 1968, Ornithologist Kitty Tonglongya was near Thailand's largest lake, Bueng Borapet, when he met some professional bird hunters who had an interesting species in their possession. They had nine of the birds, which measured about 18 centimeters long, were covered in a silky black plumage with a blue and green sheen, and had white marks around the eyes and on the rump. They also had two slender, elongated central tail feathers 
that gave them a beautiful appearance. Tong Longyan noticed that they had odd-shaped feet for martens, and that their feet were muddy. The trappers claimed that they had captured the birds roosting in reeds along the river, which confused him as their feet seemed to indicate that they preferred walking on the ground, and the mud would substantiate that theory. They were described as a new species, named after the Princess of Thailand, and in English, they now have the common name of White-Eyed River Martin. The birds are quite special. For one, they're one of only two species in the River Martin subfamily of swallows, with the other being found in Africa. Second, they're one of only two species of bird that are endemic to Thailand. Shortly after their discovery, another specimen was captured and banded by an American ornithologist named Elliot McClure. He took a series of photographs of the bird, and these are the only known photographs of a living specimen that exists today. In 1971, the birds were found in the nets of bird trappers again. The director of the Nakhon Sawan Fishery Station reportedly purchased as many as 120 of the birds from the hunters. He tried to keep them alive in captivity, but they all died. He had sent two of the birds onto the Bangkok Zoo, hoping that they would have more luck, but even these perished before long. Almost nothing was known about their ecology, since the birds had only ever been recorded after being trapped. Researchers needed to find them in the wild in order to know more about them. In 1977, 11 years after they were described, the birds were observed in the wild for the first time, at the same lake where they had first been recorded. The species only had one more confirmed sighting in 1980 at the same site. Due to the limited sightings, we only know a few things about the species. They have large mouths, which indicates that they likely prey on large insects as they fly over the water. They don't seem to like to sit on perches, instead preferring to land on the ground along sandy or muddy riverbanks. They often roosted and mingled with barn swallows, and their decline correlates strongly with a decline in barn swallow populations in the same region at the same time. Their large eyes indicate that they may be nocturnal or crepuscular, flying at twilight, which may explain why there have been so few sightings of them. And the fact that they've only ever been recorded in Thailand between the months of November and February seems to indicate that they may in fact be migratory. Where the species may spend the summer is unknown with many suspecting China as being the most likely location. Because they've never been observed in the breeding season, we also know nothing about their nesting or breeding habits. A few unconfirmed sightings have occurred since 1980, including one in Thailand in 1986 and another in Cambodia in 2004. But follow-up investigations have turned up nothing, and every search for the species since 1980 has failed to rediscover the martens. It may be that this beautiful species of bird is simply extremely rare and elusive. Or it could be that they have, sadly, gone extinct due to the degradation of their habitat and the building of dams in the region. But until serious efforts are made to confirm whether or not the species persists, they remain assessed as critically endangered by the IUCN. In 1860, a pair of ornithologists examining parrot skins collected from New Caledonia identified a new species of lorikeet. The New Caledonian lorikeet was described off of two female specimens. The bird's bodies were about 10 to 11 centimeters long, with an 8 to 9 centimeter long tail. They were mostly green and yellow, with violet blue crowns and thighs, and red markings in the anal region. While the males aren't known, it's assumed that they're likely slightly larger and probably have more red markings on their faces and wings. Today, only one of those original specimens survives, with the other having disappeared over the course of the last century and a half. 
The one we still have doesn't have collection data, so we cannot determine where or when it was collected. In 1913, 53 years after the species was described, another New Caledonian lorchid was reportedly shot near Mont Ignambi, but the body was not preserved. In the 20th century, there were only a couple of other sightings. In 1976, a local man described seeing the lorikeets back in the 1910s and 20s, though he considered them to be very rare. Once in the 1950s and once in the 1970s, a forestry official claimed to have seen a pair of New Caledonian lorikeets as they flew by overhead. The forested highlands of the island are hard to access and relatively untouched. Theoretically, if the birds have a low population, are small in size, and if they spend much of their time in the forest canopy making very little vocalization, it's possible that they've managed to go unnoticed since the 1970s. But many are inclined to believe that the species may well be extinct. The introduction of predatory species like cats and black rats has delivered a serious blow to local wildlife. Two of the other three species of native parrots to the island have seen a drastic decrease in their populations thanks to these invasive predators. For the New Caledonian lorikeets, it's also possible that they used to migrate down to lowland forests in certain seasons for food, and that food may now be so scarce or completely unavailable so that the birds are no longer able to survive. Whether the species remains alive or is now extinct is still unknown, and they remain listed as critically endangered. With its tropical lowlands, endless cloud forests, Andean Paramo, and rich Amazon jungle, Ecuador is a biodiversity hotspot. It's home to the highest abundance of hummingbird species in the world, with over 130 known species calling the country home. We only know about the turquoise-throated puffleg today because of six skins that were collected in the 1800s. Two of these specimens have labels that only say Bogota, despite the fact that we know they weren't from there. Bogota was the South American epicenter for the trade in animal skins in the 19th century. So, there are many bird specimens that we have in museum collections today that were purchased from Bogota and whose actual locality isn't known. Thankfully, when the other four specimens were collected, their actual collection data was recorded. The species is only known to occur in the grasslands of Guayabamba, a small agricultural city just outside of the Ecuadorian capital, Quito. Like most hummingbirds, the males are the ones that show the most striking coloration. The turquoise-throated puffleg, as the name suggests, has an iridescent pale blue throat and white downy puffs on the legs. There are rich golden green overall, with bluish-black forked tails and a black bill. The taxonomy of the species is still debated. It is currently considered its own species, but some have suggested that the specimens may all be hybrids, or represent a subspecies of the glowing puff leg. Other than the six skins, we have no other information about the turquoise-throated puff leg. There are no accepted records of them ever being observed alive in the wild, and in the last century, only one possible sighting has been recorded. The only valley the birds were known to live in has changed drastically over the past century. The grasslands have been converted into fields, and the city of Wayabamba is now home to about 18,000 people. But in 1976, someone claimed to see one of the birds in the region. A few years later, a survey was done to see if the species could be rediscovered, but without luck. It's presumed extinct as only a few tiny pieces of the arid grassland it needs to survive remain on the steep slopes of the Wayabamba River. More surveys need to be done to confirm that it is in fact gone, and in the meantime, it remains assessed as critically endangered and possibly extinct.
Throughout southwestern Brazil and parts of Paraguay lives an owl known as the East Brazilian Pygmy Owl. It's been recorded and studied since 1830. But in the early 2000s, something interesting was noticed about some of the museum specimens. Two of the skins, collected in 1980, had darker plumage on the head, making the white spots far more distinctive. When recordings of their calls were examined, the difference was clear. While the East Brazilian pygmy owl has a call with two or three high-pitched whistles, the one with the darker crown made a call that was a series of five to seven. It was realized that the two museum specimens actually represented a new species of pygmy owl, and the Pernambuco pygmy owl was described in 2002. Only known to occur in the Brazilian state of Pernambuco, this owl species is restricted to living in humid forests at sea level, where it inhabits the forest canopy. Sadly, the Brazilian Atlantic forest is one of the most destroyed ecosystems in the world, with 88% of it having already been destroyed, and extremely high rates of endangered and extinct species. The tiny area that the Pernambuco pygmy owl once lived in has essentially been entirely cleared. There is so little of the forest left that most researchers fear that the species is almost certainly extinct. Unfortunately, it probably disappeared before we even got a chance to study it, Besides its appearance, we know almost nothing. We have a record of one eating a large cicada, and the limited vocal recordings we have indicate that it only vocalized in the rainy season. We know nothing else. The last record of the species being seen alive in the wild is from 2001, and extensive surveys for the species have been done, but no one has been able to relocate it. If it does still exist, there are probably fewer than 50 of them left, and with the ongoing destruction of Brazilian forests, there is, sadly, little hope for their future recovery. And that's it for today's video. Which one do you think is most likely still out there? Let me know in the comments below. I need to say a special thanks to my patrons. Without their ongoing support, I wouldn't be able to make a video like this every week. If you want to support the channel, consider joining us on Patreon. The link is in the video description below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.